It's December, and you know what that means. It's time for everyone to pretend they care about the Game Awards and aren't just here hoping for a new Zelda trailer. In all seriousness, the Game Awards can be a fun time to reflect on all the games that came out in the past 365 days and have totally civil discourse about which ones we like the best. But you all know me by now. I'm not one for discussing opinions. I'm here for pure scientific inquiry. So today, I am going to statistically prove which game will win the coveted Game of the Year award for 2022. Now, the well-traveled among you viewers may notice that I am not the first to attempt such a feat. Way back in 2018, popular YouTube personality Brian David Gilbert, host of the show Unraveled over on the Polygon channel, made a similar video to this. I'm sure you can all tell that I've taken more than a few inspirations from Unraveled for my own show, and I have nothing but respect for Brian and all he did with his show. If you haven't seen his video, or any of his videos for that matter, I cannot recommend it enough. He was also horribly wrong. Now, I don't blame him, but Brian is an entertainer, not a studied mathematician or scientist. But I am. So, Brian, today I'd like to propose a little bet. If I cannot come up with a formula today that can accurately predict which game will win Game of the Year, I will, I don't know, buy you a pizza? I didn't think this part through. So yeah, the stakes are pretty high, just the way I like them. Richard, hit that intro. Right, so in order to rank all the games released this year, we're going to be going back to an old faithful that I've used a couple of times here on the channel now, the Decision Matrix. For those of you who don't know, this is a process that lets you objectively rank things across numerous different categories and then turn those rankings into a score from 1 to 10. Whichever game has the highest score at the end is the winner and your guaranteed game of the year. But before we get into any of the math, we first need to decide which games are even eligible to be considered for game of the year in the first place. If I looked at every single AAA Indian mobile game, we'd be looking at literally thousands of games. Even if I put my assistant and editor Richard and myself to work 24 seven, I don't think we'd be able to finish before the game awards came out and I'd have to buy Brian a pizza by default. Instead, I literally just copied and pasted this list of all the major titles released in 2022 from Wikipedia and put them into my spreadsheet. Now, all that's left is to turn this little spreadsheet into a mighty decision matrix. The decision matrix process has three phases to it. Yeah, but let's be honest, two of them are pushovers. The only real part that's going to take up most of your time is phase one, the criteria. What we need to do here is pick a whole bunch of things that should be considered for the game of the year candidate. These things have to be expressed with numbers for this to work. So you can't do something like what console was it on, but we could use something like cost for instance. So, what criteria come to mind when describing the quintessential game of the year? I came up with seven. First is Metacritic scores. For those of you who don't know, Metacritic is basically like the Rotten Tomatoes for video games with all its faults. I'm counting the user score and the critic score as two different criteria since I generally value the populace's opinion more than a critic, but in the end, it's the critics choosing these awards. Confusingly, the critic score is out of 100, while the user score is out of 10, yeah, but we'll deal with that later. Another easy criteria we can use is cost, since it's expressed as a simple dollar amount, super easy to just throw in our spreadsheet. However, I don't think that just throwing the base cost of a game in here and calling it a day is good enough. A lot of really amazing games cost $60, and you can go on Steam and sort by lowest cost and find some real stinkers and vice versa. Instead, I think a better way to take cost into account is by taking the game's base cost and dividing it by how long the game takes to beat, taken from howlongtobeat.com. This will give you the number of dollars spent per hour of gameplay, or in simpler terms, how much bang for your buck. Next up is graphics. Now, I'll admit, I might not be the most qualified to talk about this, seeing as I grew up playing games like Survivor for the Wii. 
Yeah, compared to that, pretty much everything looks good, so I usually don't concern myself with how a game looks. But I know that a lot of people do, and if I didn't include it, I'd risk missing out on some valuable data and making an incorrect conclusion. Chills. I may not know much about graphics with all its polygon counts and ray tracing, but if there's one thing I've learned from pure osmosis of being on Twitter, it's that FPS is king. If the game isn't showing more frames per second than your eyes can physically perceive, it ain't even worth your time. So for that reason, the game's maximum FPS is our fourth category. Unlike movies or books, video games are an interactive medium. That means that the one thing tethering you to whatever character you're embodying is your Dorito-encrusted controller. So of course, the next criteria to include is controls. Good controls can be the difference between a buttery smooth gameplay session where you're in perfect sync with whatever anime protagonist you're controlling, or a trip to the doctor to get your carpal tunnel treated. It's hard to boil down what makes a control scheme good into one simple number score, especially because everyone has different preferences, but here's the compromise I reached. I counted the number of buttons that you need to perform all the game's major actions and used that to get a control score. I considered less buttons to be better since fewer inputs to keep track of reduces the chances of you pressing the wrong button and going, no, no, I meant to jump this game. Also, the game loses two points if it doesn't allow you to remap the controls yourself. It's 2022, there's literally no excuse at this point. And no, selectable presets or system-wide remapping doesn't count. Another important factor to consider is the game's story. Not every game needs a great story to be good, but it certainly doesn't hurt either. Unfortunately, because story is such a subjective concept, there's no way to come up with a easy numeric score for them. <laughs> Annoying, I know. But fear not, for I have a way around this. We're gonna take a page out of every psych major's book and make a super bare bones survey. My plan is to create a survey where anyone can rank the story of every game they've played this year out of 10, based on both the structure of the story itself and how well it was told, because with video games especially, that can be a deal breaker. If Vati Vidya is to be believed, Elden Ring has a super interesting and powerful story. It's a shame then that I played through the whole thing and still have no idea what the hell I'm supposed to be doing except for dude calls you maidenless, now go find a tree. I've set up the survey in a way that you are allowed to skip any game that you haven't played. That way I can avoid bias of people just guessing how good a game story is based on what they've heard. I'll go ahead and post the link to this survey on my Twitter account and let the internet help me out. For my next criteria, I'm proud to announce that I will actually be taking into account a variable that Brian famously left out of his original question. I'm calling it the art quotient. That's right, the debate has raged on for long enough, but for real this time, I am here to put a stop to it and prove once and for all which games are considered art and which games are not. How am I going to do this? Well, I'm glad you asked. <clears throat> Oxford Dictionary defines art as the expression or application of human creative skills and imagination, typically in a visual form such as painting or sculpture, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. By this definition, in order to determine which games are art, we first need to quantify its beauty and emotional power. Huh. Actually, now that you mention it, we already have graphics in here, and a uh, story can probably cover emotional power, wouldn't you say? Huh, would you look at that? It's almost like all games were really art all along. Huh. Except for this one. And last but not least, we've talked a lot about the games themselves, but what about the game's greater impact on the world at large? After all, if a game is great, but nobody remembers it, was it really great to begin with? Pretty sure, I don't know, Plato said that. He talked a lot about video games, right? Basically, we want to try and quantify how the game affected the general zeitgeist and the sort of staying power it had. To do that, I'll enter the game's title into Google Trends and see how long it took from the game's release to dip below 50% maximum interest. And there you have it. 
phase one of the decision matrix is complete. Well, well mostly complete. I still need to film the data for all 1,000 plus games. So no, actually, it's, it's really not that close at all now that you mention it. But that's why I started this process a good long while before the Game Awards to ensure that I have enough time to give this problem the scientific rigor it deserves. After that, we'll move on to phase two, standardization. We got all sorts of wacky scales here. Metacritic scores range from one to 100 or one to 10 sometimes. Price is up to 60 usually. Controls is the number of buttons. It's all very hard to compare. So to make things easier, we need to standardize everything so that all our criteria are measured on a simple scale from one to 10, with 10 being the best. I won't get into any of the boring math, but basically you use this formula. If a higher number is better for the base criteria, like with Metacritic scores, or this formula if a lower score is better for the base, like with controls or something, to flip it. Once that's done, we can assign a weight to every category. Let's be honest, critic scores are probably more important than, I don't know, bang for your buck when considering what game should be the game of the year. So if we assign each criteria a percentage representing how much of the final score it represents, ensuring that all the weights add up to 100% in the end, we can account for that. Then all we need to do is multiply the standardized score by the weight for each category and add them all up to get our final score, which remember will be out of 10 possible points. So with all the methodology laid out, all that's left is to fill everything in. So if you'll excuse me, I have some numbers to crunch. All right. It's been a few weeks, and I bet you're wondering how all that data crunching is coming. Well, I'll be honest, I haven't started it yet, but fear not, for I have no intentions of buying Brian David Gilbert a pizza anytime soon. I am a recent college graduate, and my last minute project crunching skills haven't rusted just yet. As fate would have it, earlier today, the official nominees for this year's Game of the Year have been announced, whittling down my previous list of over 1,000 games to just six. So let's run through them real quick, shall we? First, we got A Plague Tale Requiem, which, well, I'll be honest, I've literally never heard of this one. Then there's arguably the fan favorite, the number one seed, Elden Ring, the fully open world spiritual successor to the critically acclaimed Dark Souls franchise. Then there's God of War Ragnarok, the long-awaited sequel to 2018's Game of the Year, God of War. Not, not that God of War, the, the reboot from 2018 that has the same name. Why do they gotta make it so confusing? Then there's Horizon Forbidden West, the franchise that seems to be forever snubbed in these awards, always releasing just days before another genre-defining open-world title that instantly gets put in the conversation for best game of all time. Looking forward to 2027, when everybody's super excited for the next adventure of Aloy, only for, I don't know, Elder Scrolls 6 to drop the next week. Stray was a sleeper hit this year, where you get to play as a cat. I haven't played this one yet, so uh, I, don't, I don't really know that much else about it. And our last nominee is... What? Xenoblade Chronicles 3? Look, I don't mean to be rude here, but seriously? This? Next to God of War and Elden Ring? <laughs> Good luck. I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of this franchise. I played the remake of the original one on the Switch a year ago, and I really didn't like it. The battles were weird, the open world was way too big, and I just spent half the time sprinting in a straight line across an open field, and the story had a comical number of heel turns and twist villains. And I watch pro wrestling on the regular, so that's saying something. I tried the sequel because it got good reviews, but after a few hours I lost the cartridge because Switch games are so freaking small, but from what I played I'm pretty sure that people only like this game for one reason. Or two reasons. So yeah, suffice to say, I don't have high hopes for this one, but who knows? Maybe there'll be a, a freak up. <laughs> no, no, I can't even say it with a straight face. This thing's losing for sure. So with all that sorted out, I should be able to quickly put in all the data and get our final scores. So for real this time, I have some numbers to crunch.
Oh, Jesus, Richard, why did you tell me sooner that the Game Awards are tonight? I don't know how to order some guy on the internet pizza. I was supposed to have this in the bag. Now, look, I know I was procrastinating a little bit, but you were supposed to remind me before... Oh, we're rolling? We're ro uh, okay. Oh, boy. Hey, everyone. It is finally that day. The Fable Game Awards are upon us. Now, if you'll excuse me, I just have a little bit of number crunching to finish up before we can get our results, and I'm totally not starting just now as we speak. So, uh... <sighs> Alright, so uh, here are the Metacritic scores. Elden Ring takes that one. No surprise there. Let's get uh, Bang for Your Buck up here. Hang on. Xenoblade 3 is a 61-hour game? Yeesh. Graphics at... Oh, would you look at that? They're all run at 60 FPS. It's almost like graphics didn't actually matter at all. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Google searches, controls. Oh, what do you know? Xenoblade is the only one that doesn't let you remap controls. Yeah, go figure. Anyway, now uh, let's get those story survey results, Richard. What do you mean nobody filled out the survey because I never remember to promote my Twitter in literally any of these videos? Well, did you at least fill it out? No, what do you mean no? You had eight weeks. Oh, don't you let you. Yeah, you know what? You know what? Uh, that's fine. That's fine. I will, I'll i just do it myself. I still have no idea what a Plague's Tale is, but uh, I'm sure it's fine. Seven. Elden Ring. Still have no clue what it's about. God of War Ragnarok. You know what? I haven't played this one either, but the first one was pretty great. So, sure. Ten. Horizon, again, eh, I'm sure it was pretty good. Seven, Stray, uh, six, and Xenoblade, yeah, probably sucks. All right, now, by the power invested in me by Excel, I command you to be standardized. Great, now just the weights. Uh, actually, you know what? I don't have time for this. I gotta work on the uh, the thumbnail and everything. So, uh, Richard, you think you can handle the weights? Just, uh, yeah, pick whatever you want. Just make sure Elden Ring comes out on top and do some cool reveal thing in post. All right, now we got four hours to edit this. Go, 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 go! Ha 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 ha!